Hello and welcome to a new season of Interpreting India. Geopolitical realignments, sustainable growth, healthcare financing, inclusive digital transformations, climate change, supply chain disruptions, urbanization and several other critical global matters envelop the world today as India holds the G20 presidency. We at Carnegie India continue to bring voices from India and around the world to examine the role of technology, the economy and international security in shaping India's future. Even though India and France have had a strategic partnership for 25 years now, the bilateral relationship between India and France has received a big impetus in recent months. The relationship spans common interests in the Indian Ocean region and the Indo-Pacific, a robust military and defense partnership, cooperation in high-tech areas such as space and nuclear, and of course a growing economic and trade relationship. What are the recent economic, military and geopolitical developments in this relationship? What were some of the major accomplishments from the French Premier's India visit and PM Modi's visit to France during the Bastille Day celebrations? What are the challenges in taking this relationship to the next level? What lessons can both countries offer to each other based on their respective economic strengths? And what are some of the commonalities and differences in the French and Indian approaches to global governance and global challenges such as climate in a multipolar world? Joining us today to discuss this topic is Ambassador Emmanuel Lenné, France's ambassador to India. Ambassador Emmanuel Lenné began his diplomatic career in 1997 serving in the French Foreign Ministry's United Nations Department where he took part in peace negotiations on Kosovo since then he has served in France's permanent mission to the United Nations in New York the embassy of France in Beijing as the prime minister's technical advisor on multilateral affairs the French embassy in Washington DC as consul general of France in Shanghai director for the Asia Pacific division of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as diplomatic advisor to the prime minister on the personal front mr lene interestingly has a passion for gelatine silver print photography and his work has been featured in many publications and interestingly he has also in in the works a couple of books uh, on in that field ambassador emmanuel lene the current ambassador of france to india welcome ambassador good morning Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. The you know the two countries, France and India, in this case, have had a long strategic partnership. I believe twenty five years now, but uh, the last year or two has really seen the the partnership uh, get a strong impetus from uh, both the visits of uh, the the french premier to india and prime minister modi's visit during the bastille day celebrations so we excited to talk about how their relationship has evolved and how it's likely to evolve in the future uh, it's obviously an important a very important one on the global stage as well so i'm looking forward to this conversation but before we dive into the france india relationship ambassador i have to ask you a couple of questions i noticed that uh, uh two things uh you know really struck me when i was going through your background and they might not be the ones you expect but the first one was that you have four boys uh you know as as a father of two daughters i had to ask you how is that different and how 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 fun is it or how energetic or draining is it to have four boys well it's very it's very energetic but uh having four boys i'm very happy when i meet people who have only girls like you <laughs> <laughs> i <laughs> i i think it, i think it's great i mean the uh, uh diversity and uh, is very important uh, i i guess that four boys it's a different atmosphere uh, I, i guess it's less subtle than a, than a girl's family like yours <laughs> I can imagine I can imagine uh, I was one of two boys and I think that also seemed like a handful um so I was very keen to hear about your experience with four boys in the house uh and the other piece that really stood out uh, that I have to ask you about is your passion for gelatine silver print photography uh which I believe you've done a lot of and uh, has also been featured in various publications uh 
How did you get into that and how have you kept up with that uh, during a time in India? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's a real passion. I've been uh, I'm a professional diplomat, obviously, but a uh, very amateur photographer and uh, spend my, my nights, my, uh, my weekends, my days off uh, shooting photos. And I've been doing that for, for quite a, a lot number of years and, uh, and uh, exhibiting in, uh, in Paris. And I did a lot in, in India also. I did a uh, I did a book with a very nice uh, Indian photographer called Raghu Rai. Of uh, course, uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, one yeah. of the most. Uh, during, uh, during, during COVID, he proposed to me to do a book. His his photos about France, my photos about India, and, and I uh, and I'm working now on a, on a book also on uh, on India, and I've been doing a few exhibitions in between in. Uh, in Chandigarh, in, Cal in Calcutta, the, uh, the Indian Museum, in, in Patna, the Bihar Museum, in uh, Ahmedabad, and uh, obviously in Delhi. And uh, I love your country. I think your country is so vibrant, so uh, so much diversity, and I mean it's never boring. So for photography, it's uh, it's a it's a huge and a wonderful playground. And uh, I've been shooting, but. Uh, uh, I, I would uh, sticking to my uh, to my usual practice in black and white, which was quite a challenge in your country, which is uh, so vibrant Colorful. with colors <laughs> and things. But I, I like also to be uh, to push myself to also to go a bit beyond the obvious. And uh, I must say, sticking to black and white in your country had me go and dig further to to see the. Uh, also the structure of the country, the things, the, uh, uh, the order be, be, uh, uh, beyond the vibrancy and sometimes the, uh, the chaos, the thing. I think your country has a wonderful thing to offer and it, it, was, a, it was a great way to also to see your country and, and to share my passion for, for your country with uh, uh, other people and uh, also outside of India. So, no, no, it's very important for, for me, this practice of photography. No, that's, uh, that's lovely to hear. That's so lovely to hear, uh, both about your uh, upcoming books with Raghu Rai and otherwise, and also the fact that you've seen both the color and the chaos, but through a black and white lens also. I think that's incredible to hear. I'm uh, personally, even I love photography. I do uh, actually a lot of... Um, nature and wildlife photography myself and of course photography of the of the kids and their antics but uh, uh right. but that's please, lovely please, to please, please, please do share your work I, I love i love to see all the people's work so please do yeah no i'd love that i'd love that um any particular uh, photos from your time in india that uh, well, I, 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 I've done different series. I mean, uh, I've been working on uh, on architecture, and uh, because it's uh, your country is wonderful for uh, even for modernist architecture in uh, in Chandigarh, in Ahmedabad, and that's so right. uh, that, that's one series I've been doing and exhibiting in the um, in Chandigarh in this wonderful museum built by Le Corbusier. Uh, I've been working also on uh, uh, the struggle or the harmony between man and nature in uh, in India, in large cities, how the nature uh, survives and sometimes thrives in larger cities. And uh, uh, this, this is a work which has been exhibited in, um, in Patna for the opening of the Biennale uh, this summer. And, and, and also I've been working because you're the, um, an exhibition called Seeing You, Seeing Me, on the, the way uh, uh, the sitter of the, uh, the subject of a photography looks at the photographer. And, and this was uh, what it was exhibited in, uh, in Calcutta, the Indian Museum. And there are such wonderful faces and uh, also uh, look full of dignity in India that uh, I love this series. No, amazing. And, you know, coming from uh, you and you know, the fact that France also has, uh, I would say some of the, personally, I can say some of the best museums in the world as well. Uh, it's great to hear that. And uh, great to hear that you've looked at that man versus nature theme as well. That's a, it's a theme that's close to my heart. I think that uh, having spent a lot of time outside of cities also uh, in India over the last uh, decade, especially, I do believe that that's a very important theme for us to capture. And wherever we can seek that harmony, achieve that harmony, I think that'd be a 
major human accomplishment. Um, no, that's lovely to hear. Uh, an ambassador, you know, coming uh, right off uh, the heels of the G20. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the G20 summit. Uh, it's, of course, captured the imagination of uh, our country, India, over the last year. And in a way that I would say few other global summits of this nature have in the past. And uh, obviously, I think as many have written about the G20 summit, uh, obviously was the culmination of a year's long set of meetings across the country uh, in various towns and cities of India uh, as well. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, what were your impressions from the G20 summit? Uh, how did it go? Um, what were some of the key accomplishments you feel from this G20 summit? Well, uh, it was, as you said, a very important summit because these days uh, uh, global governance in, is under stress, and uh, we we and we know that the capacity of the uh, uh, of international community to tackle uh, global issues we are faced with. Uh, is being harmed by uh, uh, conflict, by uh, obviously the, the war in Ukraine and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other conflicts. So it's uh, very important. Uh, and this G20 was important for, for that purpose. Uh, and the fact that uh, thanks to the Indian presidency, we could uh, uh, get some, some agreement, we could have a joint communique, uh, was a very big signal that we wanted to uh, uh, to stop the, the process of, uh, I would say, of fragmentation of the world. And this, uh, it was very important. We've been fortunate that the uh, that India, with its capacity to be a bridge between uh, different universes, different different. Uh, countries, countries from uh, what is now referred to, uh, even uh, the, I don't think it's a very apt depiction, but uh, as the global south and, and countries from the G7, countries from all, other part of the world. I think uh, we've been blessed that India, Indian was really in the driving seat at this period and uh, and could manage to get some agreement. And, and there, there, there have been some uh, some some outcome. I mean, uh, G20, as you know, is uh, uh, is most is not uh, primarily uh, a political and security uh, uh, body or forum. And uh, uh, we've uh, achieved, if, if you if you look at the outcomes, uh, there have been some new progress in the. Uh, uh, in the financing for, for development, a uh, new push for the reform of uh, international uh, financing institutions. There have been also uh, some very positive um, uh, uh, paragraphs on the, uh, on, on the uh, energy transition uh, in, in favor of climate change, the, uh, the phasing out of uh, Fossil, uh, fossil fuels, which which is very important, very important obviously for my country because we know that, you know that we are very involved, very committed, and uh, and that we uh, are present to the initiative, for example, to to organize in June uh, uh, summit on the new financial pact, which was exactly uh, dealing with these issues to be in support of the of the Indian presidency of the G20 also to prepare for the outcome. So we, we're very satisfied with the way uh, the summit uh, went on. I think that's lovely to hear. Of course, one of the other key developments that has been spoken about uh, a fair bit, which I wanted to ask you about, was the induction of the African Union into the G20. Um, now, along with the European Union, that stands as, you know, the other big grouping that's part of the G20 officially now. Um, while that's clearly significant, I wanted to ask you from your perspective, of course, France has had a long history and uh, strong ties with Africa as well, going back hundreds of years. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, how do you expect the African Union to shape the agenda of the G20 going forward? Well, we, we've been very supportive with the uh, with the uh, African Union joining the G20 for 
for long now, and uh, we've been a very strong advocate. My country is a very strong advocate about uh, a more inclusive uh, governance, and, uh, and we feel that uh, uh, there, should, there should be some uh, new uh, uh, inclusions. I mean, uh, it's true for the Treasury Council, obviously. We, as you know, we support new permanent members, and uh, India for us is on the top of the list. We've been very consistent with that. But we, we, we support also some, uh, some reform for, uh, I would say, other organizations like the IMF, uh, the World Bank. We feel it's very important if we want to be able to tackle the issue, we should take into account the, uh, the changes in the world. I mean, the world is changing, changing faster than, than ever, so it's very important. And obviously, Africa, I mean, is uh, on the move. I mean, if you look at the demographics, if you look at the um, also at the uh, the, uh, the growth, I mean, uh, uh, Africa day by day uh, is taking a lot of chunk in the uh, in world affairs, and it it should be reflected in uh, in the international body. So it's very very important. We uh, we will always push uh, for that, uh, and we feel that uh, if Africa doesn't get its shares in the governance, uh, I mean, we we collectively are going to lose. I mean, Africa has a lot of to bring. I mean, uh, and Africa also has, a, uh, I would say, a wisdom of its own. For it's been like this for for decades. I think we should listen more to Africa. Yeah, and of course, you know, I was uh, I was speaking recently to. Um, a person based in the UK um, who's a futurist uh, who looks at the future and one of the key things that he mentioned in one of the books um, he's written recently called The World in 2050 this is Hamish McRae um, he mentions that of course you know one of the major demographic shifts in the world over the next 20-30 years that we are likely to now really see is the fact that the one continent that will be growing younger and bigger uh, is Africa, right? And I think if we were to go back about 20, 30 years or 40 years and the kind of hope and the kind of optimism that many countries had for Asia, for the growth of Asia, he argues that uh, standing today, we, we must have a similar view of where Africa hopefully will land up in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And as a result, shape not just uh, the destiny of its own people, but also the, the, the global governance and, you know, the future world order. Uh, so I think it's a significant development that, uh, that they are now part of the G20 as well. Let me yeah. now move. That, 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 to... that, that, is, that is very true what your futurist friend in London says. It's very true. I mean, by, by 2050, Africa population will be roughly 2 billion. Uh, and countries like, uh, like Nigeria uh, will be... Uh, or around uh, 500 million. So it's going to be massive change and massive change. And, uh, and we should collectively do our best to, 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 to make sure that this huge potential is used for the better. I mean, uh, if, if well channeled, it can be a, a, a wonderful energy for the world. If, if it's not uh, well channeled, it can be a wonderful, uh, huge, a source of worries, problems, migrations, and uh, and disaster for, for the globe. So it's very important, right? No, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. And I think as the you know uh, as the current technological driven competition intensifies, uh, both geopolitically but also geoeconomically, and this is something I've written in my own book in the Great Tech Game. Uh, one one realizes that Africa, and especially in the recent months, we've seen this. Africa obviously holds some great and very valuable physical reserves that will be critical in the technological supply chains as well, right? Whether it's from the perspective of um, batteries, EV batteries, etc. But uh, it's important that the African economies also get diversified beyond, I think, commodities and uh, really step up into the industrial and the tech era. Uh, and, you know, higher value added, uh, more economically complex production that uh, that we've seen in obviously parts of uh, other parts of the world like Western Europe, America, East Asia, and now Southeast Asia and to some extent South Asia. And I think that will be critical if we want to avoid some of the risks 
that you were just mentioning. Uh, let me now move to uh, the, 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 the meat of our conversation today, which is the India-France relationship. Uh, Ambassador Linne, I, uh, I have to say that, you know, while some other relationships, uh, especially the US-India one, have garnered a lot of attention over the last uh, few years, as the US-India partnership has become stronger and more comprehensive than ever, the relationship that has been in place, strategic partnership that has been in place for a very long time, 25 years in this case, the france India strategic partnership, I believe is an extremely important one, extremely reliable, dependable one, and has been uh, really, I think, a, a key driver of India's own tech ambitions as well, especially in areas like space and nuclear, etc. And, you know, in the last, uh, just in the last year, I think we've seen two significant visits. We've seen uh, your premier come to India, uh, and we've seen, of course, the Indian Prime Minister uh, be part of your Basil Day celebrations uh, earlier this year. And uh, so I wanted to first start us off by asking you, where do you see that relationship now? How has it evolved in the last couple of years, especially? And what have been some of the key accomplishments, you would say, over this time period, from an economic, military, diplomatic, trade perspective well wow, that's a that's a big question uh, well it's the relation is just uh, outstanding it's unique i mean it's the uh, because it's it's based on a, on a lot of trust i mean we we've been uh, the best of partners for decades now there's never been any change it's very unusual i mean uh, when you when you look at foreign policy for for most countries and he, uh usually there are some changes there are, you have new uh, president new prime minister you have new majority uh, new circumstances and then you, you you change your foreign policy i mean the uh, india france in my country there's never been any debate and i mean uh, left right whoever is in power since your country is uh, is independent it's always been very consistent. We've always thought uh, that uh, we should uh, do more and more with India, uh, giving that India uh, will always be uh, with us, uh, the largest democracy, a rule of law, and, and a country with a, a strategic thinking just like us, just willing to be independent and a force for good on the international stage. So uh, there's never been any doubt. and. Uh, when each other uh, we've been uh, facing some difficulties some things we've always uh, stood side by side uh, uh, i like always to remember the uh, uh, the time when for for example you you made your nuclear test in 1998 in Pokhan when you, some countries uh, did blame you sanction you uh, and we were there uh, quite uh, understanding because we we know what it's, uh, it takes to be uh, uh, to have some autonomy when you had issues also uh, with your following year with uh, some neighbors we were there to uh, also to uh, to provide some support and, and it's always been like this uh, you've been also on our side and reciprocated at different period even during covid recently when uh, we needed to be export of uh, uh, medical drugs which were uh, daily needed in our hospital you were there so uh, there's ne I think that's what makes it very special, there's trust and consistency. Then now, what are the biggest achievements? Obviously, we've done a, a lot in terms of security, defense, to boost our, our autonomy, and it's very important. I mean, if we don't want to rely on uh, uh, this or that superpower, uh, and we don't want to be the junior partner, we have to uh, to collaborate, to uh, to share some expertise, some technologies, some training. It's very important, and that's what we do. I mean, uh, and we've been having some some great success, uh, also with uh, top uh, equipment like Rafale and others. I mean, but we we do we do much more than that. We uh, we're cooperating on on space. Uh, ISRO has been working with a sister institution in France for decades now. I mean, we are we are partner for 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 you. Uh, inhabited flight. Uh, we train. We do a lot of things together. 
and, and, and much more than that. We do a lot of, uh, uh, in terms of business, we, we work a lot together. I mean, the, uh, your country is uh, fully engaged in the huge uh, the energy and climate transition. Uh, we have uh, uh, French companies expertise on water sanitation, on smart grids, smart transportation, uh, doing a lot. Our development agency, I mean, uh, has uh, put uh, India on uh, number one priority. I mean, there's no other country where we uh, every every year we grant so many, so many loans to help for this transition, for this uh, uh, to build some new subways, to build some new dams, and so on and so forth. And also, I want to stress our, our, what sort of progress we've made and how it's important people to people exchanges. Because when you have such a great friendship between two countries, at the end, I mean, uh, it doesn't last if you don't have uh, more and more people exchanges, more and more students going from to each other's country, more, more tourists, more of a, more of a, a culture from each other being shown, and we are making progress on that. Huh? We this 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 year we have ten thousand students from from India going to France. They are very welcome. Our universities are happy to have them. They have a lot of energy, a lot of drive. They are very good companion to uh, for for our students. And now the target is by 2030 to have 30,000. They are very welcome. They can do most of their study now in English. Their, their curriculum is easy, so they, they don't have to uh, to uh, uh, to speak French prior to the departure. And it's uh, it's a great system. So uh, yes, there's a lot being done. So that's amazing. I I know that that was a very big question, broad question, and I think you gave us a a very quick overview of uh, how that relationship has stood the test of time and crises, but also how multi-dimensional it is. I want to dig deeper into a few of these dimensions, if I may. Um, let's start with maybe the, the defense partnership. Uh, you obviously referred the nuclear tests uh, that India conducted uh, in 98 and how France stood by India. But of course, the military defense partnership between India and France has grown by leaps and bounds. Tell us a little bit more about that and the vision for that also in the future. Uh, what extent do we expect co-development of technology as well of course, uh, yeah. in that space? Of course. Well, uh, we, 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 we need to, uh, to be partner for security because we, are, we have the same uh, goals. We want uh, a rule-based uh, order, uh, and uh, especially in this region, in the Indo-Pacific, which is very important. It's important, obviously, to you for, 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 for geographic reasons. It's important to us also because we, we feel that we are resident power. We are your neighbor. We have uh, one, one million and a half uh, French people, French citizens in the region. Small number compared to India's population, quite a different number from my, from, from my, from my country, and uh, and we feel we have a, we have interest. So we do a lot of uh, joint training. We do a, a lot of uh, uh, information exchanges. We uh, uh, you may remember that we were first to send liaison officers to IFC IOR to uh, uh, to to share some info, and, and as you said, we we work also on equipment. Because the uh, none of our uh, countries these days can uh, just develop equipment for its own army, uh, and it's not viable. We have to uh, we have to share, and and we have to work together. Otherwise, we we can't get the, the latest uh, technologies and develop them. It's too uh, it's not affordable. And uh, what's going on with India? I mean, we, we started at the beginning with friends having a lot of technology and, uh, and sharing it like no other country. Uh, no other country has given its latest technology to, to India with, uh, with uh, partners. And it's been going on like this for, for years. And uh, we, we uh, Dassault, for example, started to, uh, uh, to sell aircraft fighters to India in the 1950s. And uh, that was the, uh, called the uh, Tufani, and uh, and since then been equipping the Air Force with all its uh, uh, aircraft fighters. 
Um, but now, as you said, the, uh, as the India is so developing so fast and, uh, pro uh, and producing such uh, highly talented engineers, uh, we are less and less in, in the sort of relation where we, we, we share some friends, share technology with India. Uh, now we're, we're in the process where it will be more and more Indian friends uh, co-developing the next generation of, uh, of equipment. And uh, in India, and for good, is producing its own uh, defense uh, industry. I mean, that's a process we've been through also, we respect it and we want to be partner in that. Uh, and for the next generation, we want really to go develop. And that's what we, we, we propose to do uh, for, for your uh, next generation, for the fifth generation of aircraft fighters. We, we, uh, our companies are, are proposing to uh, review engineers to, uh, to work on your, on your specification, what is required for your Air Force, in terms of power, in terms of uh, uh, capability, and to uh, jointly to um, to um, uh, develop it so that uh, you you will be fully master of the technology, and that's quite a, that's quite a, a change. But I think it's uh, really uh, in keeping with uh, the nature of the partnership between our two countries. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's 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 good to hear. That I think that. The relationship, the defense partnership, is also evolving into more of a a, a two-way partnership. I think, as you as you alluded to, um, and and specific uh, co-development projects that you've mentioned, I think um, around the aircraft. I think that would help the Indian defense industry also um, step up and uh, also meet the local specifications that you know the Indian Air Force might require, etc. And hopefully, then jointly also provide other nations, uh, I'm assuming, equipment that might then meet their requirements as well. Um, I want to focus a little bit also on the Indian Ocean region, which you alluded to, the Indo-Pacific, uh, as it's now being termed as well. Uh, I believe uh, EU, the EU has a global gateway initiative as well. Talk to us, please, a little bit about more about that, how that's been progressing, and uh, what do you see as some of the challenges and opportunities on that front. Well, it's a it's a massive uh, program. Eh? It's uh, it's always like this with the European Union. We the European Union doesn't try to impress, to make big announcement, and to and to show off. But it's very consistent, and then it it, it yields results over the years, and it's uh, <coughs> it's more uh, actually it's more efficient than than, than anything else. Uh, and Global Gateway, it's exactly in that spirit. So uh, it's a huge, huge, huge program. Uh, the budget is uh, above 300 billion euros. It's uh, totally, totally mind boggling. And it will be invested over the years on a connectivity uh, project and uh, uh, across the planet, but also uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region, so it will provide uh, uh, high quality, sustainable uh, infrastructures, and will help also uh, to uh, improve the resilience of the countries. And uh, uh, I'm pretty confident that we're going to have some nice project in uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. And would this include? Uh, I'm assuming it also includes digital infrastructure, okay, sure, sure. Uh, connectivity. So, for example, undersea cables. I believe France yeah. has one of few companies that today have expertise in the in the laying of undersea cables, etc. And as the digital connectivity increases, and that was a key map. For example, I had in my book as well, uh, showing the the undersea cable map of the world. Uh, so, does it have a big digital infrastructure component as well? No, you're, you're, you're totally right. I mean, the, uh, that's, a, that's a big priority. And uh, uh, we, we, we want to focus on 21st century infrastructures. I mean, the, uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, rail or roads or airport are, are 20th century and that uh, uh, care bonds, uh, 5G, 6G, internet access, are broadband are uh, uh, 21st century, but that's uh, that's a bit true. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> we, we, that, that's a priority. Yeah, and I think that that's a critical priority because I remember as I 
uh, looked at that map, it was very striking that, you know, when you looked at the sub subsea cable map of the world, the connectivity between Europe and America, not surprisingly, is the strongest in terms of the number of cables. And as you mentioned, resilience as a result is also achieved when you have this multiplicity of the cable network. Yeah. Um, but when you looked at Europe to Asia, Europe to Africa, Africa to Asia, uh, of course, there seems like, um, and this is obviously a function of just the data flows between mm. these regions, but it seems that like there was a lot of work to be done there to both connect further and also to add to the resilience of these regions. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. And that's, uh, and we, 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 we want this, uh, so there will be some new connection between the, the continents you mentioned, but uh, what, what, what we want is to make sure that these connections are, are done in a consistent manner. And uh, uh, as you say, that they are uh, resilient, that they are uh, also uh, open to, uh, to our countries and that uh, there's no uh, security uh, threats or interferences by any big country. And it's very important. Very important. That's, uh, that's no, it is. It is. In fact, uh, if I may share a historical anecdote, which I'm sure you're familiar with, <laughs> Uh, which I found very interesting when I was doing the research for my book was uh, this idea going back to what we're discussing about subsea internet cables actually goes back uh, into history at least 150, 200 years when the telegraph cables were being laid around the world and, uh, and, and the great powers of that time, uh, including France, the UK and others, uh, had lots of geopolitical... Uh, battles play out over these telegraph cables. I believe the UK called it their all red network. Mm. And they were often worried uh, about the security and safety of their network, as were other countries like France, Germany and Russia. So there is uh, a very interesting, I think, parallel in history mm. when we look at uh, the sure. subsea cables. Sure, sure. Uh, history sometimes repeats itself. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, you know, as I was discussing with someone the other day, they said it very nicely. They said the history might not repeat itself. And this is a quote that is uh, attributed to Mark Twain. They said history might not repeat itself, but it definitely rhymes. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good quote. I didn't know it. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me move to the uh, economic part of uh, economic aspects of the India-France relationship. Mm. Now, uh, if you look at trade, if you look at other kinds of economic cooperation, where do these two countries stand? What does trade look like today, both in terms of numbers, but also its composition and growth rates? Well, uh, it's good, but it's not good enough. I mean, it's uh, we're cl clearly under potential. I mean, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, French investment in, in India. Uh, because we have, uh, we have massive talents, massive capacity. We want to have more supply chains in your country. Uh, investment from India to France is, uh, is growing. It's growing steadily, but it's, uh, uh, it's much less. It's growing. But the, uh, the real, the real uh, uh, sector when under potential is trade, as you said. I mean, it's uh, we should we should do much better. So we do we do very well for aeronautics or for certain technologies, but all the rest it's uh, it's very under potential because we, for example, for uh, usually we are in France we are very strong to uh, for uh, agro food for consumer goods for. And, and it's not where it should be. And you, India should be able also to export much more to France. And this is uh, because we have too many uh, trade barriers between our two countries. And, um, but it takes time. It's, it's, uh, it's complex. There's a, there's a free trade agreement under discussion between the EU and, uh, and India. It's, uh, it's complicated. We, we negotiate in good faith. But it's uh, not easy, and now, as you know, our public opinion also needs uh, some very strong provisions on the, the fight against climate change, different aspects. So, uh, we hopefully it will uh, 
come to conclusion, but it's um, it's tricky. That's right. That's right. Uh, and and because it's tricky, let me dig deeper um, on this point. Um, you know, because it's obviously a very important point. I'm a key believer, big believer in the fact that for any strategic partnership to be truly strategic, uh, beyond the military, defense, technology dimension, there has to be a very strong fundamental economic dimension. I think that's what really sustains partnerships uh, over a long period of time as well. And so this is an important question. The barriers that you mentioned, right? You started off our conversation saying there's a lot of trust underlying the France-India partnership. That said, when it comes to trade and economic ties, there seems to be a lot of uh, barriers, differences in perspectives, and not necessarily consensus on how to move forward. Um, one, why is that? Like, what are some of the core reasons, if you were to dig deeper, behind those differences in perspectives and lack of consensus? And second, so if that's the, the problem, what is the possible solution? Is there a vision that's being evolved to figure out a way to solve that problem also? Uh, I, I, I think we have to uh, we have to uh, decide in good faith that uh, uh, trade and exchanges are, are good for for all countries, uh, we, which which which, me, which means the uh, uh, when you when you open your borders, then the uh, it makes you more competitive, but obviously um, you have to uh, you have to uh, to to be aware that there there will be some sectors which will suffer from more competition in the beginning. So you have to 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 put in place some transition periods. Some uh, you have to you have to take that into account. And the, these are provisions that we have to negotiate. But on the long run, we have no. Uh, uh, hesitation that uh, more exchanges between our countries is uh, a good thing uh, and, and that uh, we can do it and uh, have a, a level playing field and uh, there, are, there, are, there are countries with which we, we know that uh, we'll never get that and we are de-risking from these countries because we, we know this, uh, they, are, they are not fair players. Uh, but with India, uh, we f we feel that uh, it's uh, it's a country where we can uh, safely uh, put some activity and do business over the years, and we, uh, it's not a strategic gamble. We we are very confident. And if I was to you know ask you, how does the India France trade uh, look like in terms of numbers compared to let's say what? Uh, France might have with China. What is the? Um, it's uh, right now it's less, but it's uh, it's uh, moving up. Um, we we're doing a lot with with India uh, in uh, aeronautics and, and defense. And what is lacking again? It's uh, it's real. Uh, it's uh, consumer goods, uh, and this this is really pity because we we could do a lot uh, to address the need uh, of Indian market. I mean, uh, population uh, as, uh, an aspiration uh, and new urban dwellers. There's a lot to be done, and uh, and, and it could be really win-win for for our two countries. But, it, uh, but are there any lessons from how, let's say, Europe and China might have increased their trade and reduced trade barriers here for the France-India or the EU-India trade partnership as well? Are there any lessons there? Are there some things that really worked there that uh, you and India could uh, pick up on or learn from? But uh, we, 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 we don't want to uh, we don't want India to to draw the lessons from China because uh, as you know uh, many of our countries have uh, a lot of uh, reservation with the way uh, China is doing business we we, 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 we don't feel it's uh, it's a, a fair competitor in many in many aspects huh? uh, what I what I what I would say uh, if you look at what made it uh, easy uh, to do business with China. And I think that on that side, uh, India uh, can uh, uh, 
uh, take some lessons, but I, I know that all your leaders and uh, your business leaders of the community has that in mind. I mean, obviously, uh, and, uh, and India is, is moving very fast on that. Infrastructures, it's very important. And, uh, and India is massively these days building infrastructure. So yes, uh, and uh, ease of doing business. I mean, uh, sim uh, streamlining, simplifying, uh, faster procedure, uh, single window, and all this. But uh, that also, I mean, it's uh, India is moving very fast. So uh, I don't, I don't think, I don't think India has, uh, has a lot to it to, to learn. <laughs> yeah, I think you're very uh, and, and moving. <laughs> um. On that optimistic note, I want to move to two other spaces that I want to quickly get your views on. One is uh, on the future of space. Now, of course, India is uh, one of the most recent uh, achievements that India has um, expressed a lot of pride in and has uh, received global accolades for is Chandrayaan-3, uh, our moon landing. You mentioned, obviously, the France uh, partnership, the French partnership with ISRO over the years. But I want to ask you about the future of space. What is your view on where is where are we headed now when it comes to space, given that there has been a long hiatus in the space exploration from the perspective of certain Western countries? And now over the recent years, though, there is a renewed interest in space, uh, in, in, in obviously the moon, different parts of the moon. Of course, Mars is being spoken about. And there's obviously also this idea that there's geopolitics at the core of this yeah. well, uh, uh, space. The, so I wanted to get your views on the future of uh, of, of space, yeah. space exploration. Well, we, 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 the only thing we know is that there will be a formidable development and in directions that we we don't know for sure right now. And that means that we, we, we need to be agile and flexible. Uh, and uh, and that's really why uh, we we respect the um, uh, the way uh, your space sector has been evolving, and we want to to work uh, uh, more and more uh, with India. I mean, the way that you, uh, uh, your your um, uh, sector has been opening to a, to a private sector. To, uh, uh, and to a lot of startup uh, gives uh, to, to generates a lot of innovation uh, and uh, that's that's why uh, when your prime minister came to to Paris in um, in July uh, we, we made sure that there's an agreement on space cooperation which is exactly about that interconnecting uh, our two ecosystem not just uh, uh, ISRO and the uh, sister institution in France, but all the all the stakeholders to make sure that we they can jointly innovate. Uh, if you look at the space industry, I mean, uh, uh, one of the major breakthrough has been the uh, for launchers be uh, reusable. I mean, and this has not been achieved by uh, by NASA or other, but but it's by SpaceX. Yeah, but, but exactly, and, and the future uh, will be will be again like this. There might be some breakthroughs, some uh, uh, things, and uh, the, the, uh, to plug our ecosystem and to to let the startups thing work together is very important. Then, in which direction? I think we're going to be surprised. I mean. Uh, we now, now, uh, congratulations! India is going on the south side of the moon, and uh, and, and tomorrow we will go further. So we we are planning for that. We, uh, but um, it's virtually it's going to grow a lot, and in direction we don't suspect. So, uh, as a decision maker, political decision maker, you must make sure that your organization is agile and, and ready to innovate. And there's not much more you can do, but it's very important. Yeah, and do you worry that beyond the innovation piece, which is obviously very positive, uh, do you feel that geopolitics will 
become very central to, well, to the it, future it, of space? It, 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 it's always been, I mean, uh, a matter of geopolitics, a reflection of power. I mean, uh, you, you, you remember during the Cold War, what a, a, a wake-up call was for the US, the first uh, Sputnik in the uh, flight in, uh, in 1957, and it's been the case for, for, for long. So this is, uh, it will be. What matters is that uh, we make sure that the, uh, even if it's um, a competition, that it's, uh, it's regulated and, uh, and by, uh, under international norms and agreed upon norms. Uh, and for example, it's not uh, uh, a uh, uh, it's, it's not a uh, fierce competition or uh, uh, heavily uh, uh, militarized, and uh, and, and uh, that's why uh, we have some concern when the when, when satellites are targeted and, uh, for example, or some uh, uh, military equipment are just. Uh, uh, being positioned into that space, but uh, this needs some uh, discussion, some cooperation, some maybe some treat the new treaties or amendments in the future, and that's what also we're working on with like-minded partners. Yeah, and what about nuclear now? So nuclear obviously has been at uh, you know an important uh, aspect of India-France cooperation as well. But you feel there's a lot of talk of small modular nuclear being the future of nuclear plants. Is that your assessment uh, as well? Uh, uh, are we moving towards more small and modular plants or not? Uh, nuclear, uh, we're talking for possibly nuclear, uh, the discussion. Yes. Yeah, okay. So no, no longer for defense. Yes, because we, um, we feel that it's uh, uh, nuclear is unavoidable as, uh, as part of the other, of the, uh, climate transition for, 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 for a country like India. I mean, India is uh, admirable in the way uh, it deploys some uh, uh, re, um, uh, solar, some uh, wind energy. I mean, no country can uh, deploy so yeah. But there, there, are, there are limits to what you can do uh, these days in, in con storage. So, uh, Correct. At least until storage gets figured out, there's a limit. There are limits. Yes. You, you, you need, you need at the, you need at the, at the core of your base load uh, some stable energy. And right now for India, it's coal, unfortunately, 70% coal. Then if you want to move out of that and go with decarbonated energy, uh, there are not that many alternatives. I mean, we feel that uh, that is nuclear, but nuclear, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good. I mean, it makes you autonomous. I mean, uh, France had made its choice decades ago, and uh, right now, 80% uh, of electricity is provided for nuclear, so which means we don't we don't rely on anybody, and we have the cheapest energy in Europe. But it's uh, is that the highest in the world in terms of the share of total energy mix? Is that the highest? Uh, might, might be, might be. I should check on that. But might be, be. Uh, 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 and we we feel that that's the, that's the right solution. The thing is that the, uh, it requires some uh, some investment because your 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 equipment will be, will run for 50 60 years so it's a, it's a big initial investment and that's what we we're discussing with uh, with India right now also yeah um, let me move to uh, uh, another topic that's close to my heart which is lessons that two countries can draw from each other's uh, economic models. Right. I think as you've mentioned now a couple of times during our conversation that there's there's a lot that can be done on the consumer brand side by France uh, for the Indian consumer, especially for the aspiring Indian consumer. Uh, I think people are familiar generally with France's industrial success. We've spoken about a few sectors in that space also. What lessons do you think beyond what we've already discussed? Could Indian companies draw from the French economic Industrial consumer-driven development model. Uh, I don't. I don't think Indian companies have a lot to learn from uh, from other companies. I think they are, uh, they are they are pretty impressive. And I must say that when I when I when I meet with uh, 
business captains from India. I'm quite, I'm quite impressed and they are, I think the organization are working very well. And I don't think it's any surprise if, the, uh, if major companies, uh, especially tech companies in the US are run by people of Indian origin. I think, uh, I don't think for business there's much to learn. Um, obviously, there could be there could be more uh, brands uh, in India, but this needs time to to build. I mean, uh, uh, but I think it's going to happen in the future to have more brands. It requires uh, some attention to uh, uh, to marketing, to product, and uh, rather than only look at your bottom line on price and things like this, but I think it's, uh, it's, going, it's going to happen. There's so much talent, so much uh, craft and things like this. You know, I think we're going to see more and more uh, uh, Indian global brands uh, coming up, yes. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully not just in the luxury space, but obviously, you know, French brands in India have, uh, I think, had a lot of collaboration yeah. creatively also over, over the last you know, a few centuries, uh, one can argue, yeah. but also, and I would say the the middle market uh, brands as well, yeah. where I think, as you rightly said, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, different kinds of brands that could come out of India mm. in various spaces, food, apparel, mm. and, and and so on and so forth, and tea mm. and coffee, etc. Yeah. That uh, could do well in mm. other parts of the world. Mm. What about the Indian uh, startup ecosystem? What's uh, you know, obviously, there's a positive view of India stack and no, it's, really, it's, really, it's really impressive. I mean, that uh, you 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 can have the uh, uh, landed so many unicorns uh, over the last uh, three four years, and uh, that you have so many startups that your economy is so digitalized. I mean, it's, uh, it should be a great matter of pride for your country and a great matter of hope for for the future. So France being also the country with largest number of startups and the uh, uh, and very innovative system in Europe, we're we are, we are plugging the uh, our incubators right now and uh, uh, having more and more links. I mean, uh, uh, with ecosystems as, as uh, the one you have in Bangalore or Hyderabad, and uh, we are doing a lot. But yes, I mean it's uh, it's formidable, formidable, formidably creative and uh, innovative. Yes. And of course, another piece that, you know, we didn't discuss so much in the G20 context was the digital public infrastructure piece that, you know, was part of various statements. Yeah. Uh, what's your view of where the digital public infrastructure uh, could go over the next 10, 15 years in the world? Uh, I, I, Do you feel like that will become the global uh, consensus around building such kind of digital public infrastructure as opposed to it being controlled or, or managed by just a few firms? Yeah. Or is that a tough uphill task? Uh, we, we feel it's very, uh, it's very democratic and very legitimate to have such uh, open uh, infrastructures. And uh, we recommend India for, for the model it has built. And, the, uh, we, we, and, and we must say every, uh, every visitor I have is impressed by the, the development of your of UPI, of your ADAR, of the, and all your, uh, it's, uh, it's really show, show the way. I mean, it's, uh, nobody can, uh, nobody can object. It's more, it's more democratic than, uh, than anything else. Yes. So yes. Oh, again, we're working on that. And do you expect adoption of that to go beyond just, you know, payments between countries like, let's say France and India or Singapore and India? Do you expect much broader adoption of that in the coming years? Yeah. You feel in the, even in the Western world? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of interest, and we um, we have uh, we have many visitors to come to India these days to study how it works and things like this. But uh, yes, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure it will um, it will develop uh, uh, much beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Let me now just conclude our conversation with, with a quick question around global governance. Okay. You mentioned earlier that India and France obviously have some commonalities in the way they view the world. They want to be independent. Mm. They have their own view of the world. They want to be a force for good. Um, what are some um, things that you think India and France could work together on on the global governance stage? Obviously, you mentioned that global governance has taken a beating uh, in recent years in many ways. Uh, are there any specific tangible initiatives that 
France and India could be working together on now that would help uh, make sure that global governance remains robust yeah. and that we don't end up in a Cold War-esque type situation? No, totally. I, I, I think we have a lot uh, assets to develop together, uh, being a democracy, being a rule of law, being also uh, fundamentally attached to, uh, uh, to diversity, to cultural, to uh, diversity, to, uh, uh, is important. I mean, uh, our two countries have been advocating for decades now that the world should be uh, uh, multipolar, a country diverse and that we we should retain that uh, i think we we can build on that and right now um i think our countries are in a, in a unique position to uh, to avoid that the world is fragmented as you as you said uh, and uh, in the coming months we will try to uh, to to build bridges uh, to uh, to take some new initiative. I mean, the, uh, my country, uh, my president took the initiative to uh, to convey in par to convene in Paris this uh, uh, summit on the new uh, financial pact. I mean, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, and you remember, I mean, uh, he also extended an hand and went uh, and said he was willing to join. Uh, uh, the, uh, the different uh, uh, summit and the, the BRICS summit in South Africa and Philadelphia. It's very important that we 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 should uh, make sure that there there are bridges and and discussion because we're not going to achieve anything if we uh, if we go back to a world uh, fragmented into blocks and uh, given the magnitude of the challenges we have so. Yes, we you, you will see more and more, and uh, uh, and we have definitely uh, a role to play. India, for sure. India being uh, really at the, uh, the crossroads of many uh, organizations, many uh, many working from Quad, from BRICS, for trying a cooperation organization. I'm going to Asia. I'm not going to name everything, but that's uh, that's the specificity of your. Uh, diplomacy and countries to be able to to manage uh, so many formats and uh, and have deep and meaningful relation with many many countries. So we should use that as, uh, as uh, to uh, we should leverage on that to, um, to to make a difference. Yes. Yeah. No. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. This has been a Thank you very fascinating Thank you conversation, you wide ranging. It's a pleasure to talk to Kalaji. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Pleasure. This has been a pleasure, and and best of luck for your for your future uh, assignments. And hopefully, we'll keep seeing you in India. Pleasure. Talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. To make sure you don't miss it, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts from. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit us at carnegieindia.org. You can also find us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for listening and see you next time.